This is Tape 2 of Buddhist Psychology and Western Psychotherapy. Um, or inner sublimation. You can take, for example, grasping and um, a kind of compulsive lust. And you can learn through um, meditations ways to move that energy from being solely that lustful desire to bring it up to your heart so it becomes more of the energy of, of love, of compassion, of contact. So you can transmute energy. Now, there are a couple of other ways in this traditional Buddhist (coughs) list of working with difficulties, but it sounds pretty modern to me. Fantasy is another. If if these don't work, then you can imagine taking that thing. They get more dangerous, as you can see. Imagine taking that thing and doing it to the limit, you know, either, either going for that wonderful desire and just acting it out to its extreme or if you're angry, biting that person or kicking them or whatever, you know, is in your mind to do until it plays itself out. But because they get more dangerous because there's more of a tendency to identify with things in these. And then if you identify what happens, you just keep the habit going. Not only are you angry, but you get angrier. Not only do you want, but you reinforce the wanting. So the danger with fantasy is that you identify, and therefore you need to do this mindfully. Mindfulness is the key to working with all of these things. Then the last and the most tricky, is more tantric, is to act it out. And, um, you know, you have to be careful, because when you act things out, then you get the karma back. You know, so if you're going to act out your anger, you'll get something back. It's not so horrible unless you're going to act out going to kill somebody or something, that's pretty bad. But you're going to yell at somebody or something, all right, you just know what the fruit's going to be. Sooner or later, it'll come back. But at times, when none of these others work or in certain situations, it's appropriate. One of the teachers I studied with who was really hooked on sweets, he just loved Indian sweets, gulab jamun. Gulab jamun are so sweet they make baklava seem like dry toast. (laughs) They're really sweet. So he was tired of being addicted to gulab jamun. And he went to the market one day, and he ordered a plate of like 40 rupees of gulab jamun. I mean, that's a huge plate. And he made himself eat it until he got sick. And it basically cured him gulab jamun and probably other illnesses as well for a long time. So there are ways, but again, you have to be attentive because if you act it out and there isn't mindfulness, you just get into repeating the same old habit again. Now, I only have a few more things. I'm getting there. The root of the question may still be in your mind. Psychotherapy and spiritual practice, are they the same or are they different? And you read different opinions on it, you know. Jacob Needleman, who's written a lot of very good books on these kind of topics, say that they're very different, they're not the same. Or you read even a great Tibetan sage and saint like Milarepa, who talks about how empty the personality is and how fruitless it is really even to to bother with it. My sense of it is that it's really... uh, level specific, that it relates to different levels of body, feelings, mental patterns, the content of it. And the heart of spiritual practice, which I've seen very rarely in psychotherapy, is what's called the Dharma of Liberation. And the Buddha said a number of times, I don't teach for happiness or bliss or rapture or insight or concentration or good deeds or merit or any of those things but the sure heart's release. This and this alone is the purpose of my teaching. For people to learn how not to be caught, to be liberated in every sense of that word, from the body and the mind and in every way, because that attachment or that being caught is the source of suffering. Psychotherapy, when it's done in a spiritual context, leads one at least in the direction of that liberation. It can be in relation to attachments to body, attachments to feeling, to mind, to different, different thoughts. Because the Four Noble Truths in Buddhism, which is another model, I'm not going to teach you much of tonight, it says there's suffering in the world, there's a cause for suffering, which is attachment or grasping or identification. 
there's a possibility of liberation, of release from that, of living in a free, open, different way than that. And there's a path to doing it, which is the Eightfold Path, that I also won't go into detail about, but it basically is a path of awareness or mindfulness. So now I come to the most important um, meditation model of the evening, and the last <coughs> one I'll use, and it's called the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. And it's the heart of Buddhist meditation, and it's also the heart of much psychotherapy. It's mindfulness of, or awareness of body, and that means sights and sounds and bodily sensations. Mindfulness of feelings, awareness of feelings. Mindfulness of the mind, which includes all its stories and contents of liking and disliking and hopes and fears and plans and memories. And then mindfulness of the Dharma, which in this case, Dharma is a word that's used in many contexts. Mindfulness of Dharma means mindfulness of the, of the underlying principles, the truth, the structure, the process of our very being. And so one can be, and usefully so, use psychotherapy to be aware of the way we get blocked or tight in our body and to release that and to open that. And there are body therapies that do it and there are meditations that do it. One can learn to be aware of how we're blocked or caught up or attached and create suffering through the realm of feelings, through meditation, through different kinds of psychotherapy. One can do it with the story and the content of mind, of likes and dislikes and plans and memories. One can use it, although it's not so often done in psychotherapy, and this is where I think someone like Jacob Needleman or even Milarepa point to, there's a deeper possibility if the mind is trained in a powerful degree of stillness and awareness, tranquility and investigation, both sides, that one can see most deeply what's true which is that we, as separate beings, do not exist. That it's all a play of light and shadow, and that whole sense of fear and all our struggle comes out of this sense of separateness, and that it's really not true. Somehow we need to recognize that, that we're really all in this together, in this process of birth and death and having bodies and minds and that there's no such thing as the, the, the therapist and the client really. We're really all in the soup, you know, on this ball hanging in space, as I said. And the thing for me that's perhaps most important about meditation, it's difficult if you do the right kind or you do it properly. At times it'll be difficult, at times it can be really joyful is that, it, that it's tremendously human. That when you sit down, especially in the kinds of retreats, for example, that I teach where you take 10 days or two weeks or a month, and you sit, and your whole job is just to listen to, your, to yourself. And you listen to your bodies and your feelings and your mind and your, all your inner voices and the, the knots that you've accumulated from your work and running around, and you let them relax a little. And you listen to being alone and your sorrows, and you, what you want, and your joys. It makes one tremendously human. It's like you hear all the voices that there are to hear inside. And only then, only if you really listen, can you touch another person with, with real compassion. And so I close by telling you what happened to me, actually. It's kind of funny. I came back from the, from the monastery to this country, and not knowing what else to do, um, I went back to uh, graduate school. Because um, what, what's one trained to do in the society? You're trained to be a student, right? So, all right, I'll be a student again. And part of my graduate work, a master's level, was I was working in a mental hospital. And I thought, good, I'll go into the mental hospital and I'll help all those crazy people. I'll teach them meditation and, you know, it'll make it all better. I was quite naive at the time. I got in the hospital, it was a state hospital in an, in a, an acute ward. Most of the people were what they call psychotic. Um, and I realized very quickly, 
that meditation was not the right thing for these people. In fact, the very definition of their difficulty was that they couldn't pay attention without getting caught or identified in something. Um, they, I couldn't teach that. They couldn't be mindful. That was almost the definition of their illness. Um, and that the last thing they needed anyway for most of them was to close their mind and go somewhere else. Most of them were somewhere else. They needed to come back from somewhere else. And the thing that seemed useful to them at all when I continued to work there was very concrete, concrete ways of mindfulness. Mindfulness of gardening, doing yoga or movement, bringing people back into their bodies and out of the place in their mind that they got caught or afraid or identified. But you know who did need the meditation. You all know, don't you? <laughs> the doctors, the nurses, the attendants, they were nutty. They were both, both, they were actually, if you really look, this is an old state hospital, most of them have been there a long time, and it was really hard to tell who was who, you know. And the other thing is that um, it was really a situation of fear. They were a lot afraid of all the stuff that was coming out of the patients. And so they would drug them, and it was kind of as most uh, state mental, mental institutions are. It was a big control institution. Drug them, keep them quiet. And it wasn't just partly, of course, to save money and keep it quiet, but a lot because those people, the social workers and the doctors and the nurses and attendants, themselves had never looked at their own death and their own fear and their own loneliness and the things that the patients were looking at. God knows they didn't want the patients to bring it up very much. It was real scary. And so what seemed most important to me, and perhaps that's why it's in some ways more useful to talk to you than, the, than your patients or your clients in some way, is that, that the heart of, the, of practices is to understand that and to transform oneself, to open one's heart, one's being, to look at all those things and learn through systematic training that we have the capacity to develop this brightness of <coughs> mindfulness, of awareness, of openness that transforms every other aspect of our life. So, I thank you. open it up to questions and discussions in the audience. So, Roger Walsh. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we're kind of at a, we're at a unique period in, in human history in many ways. Uh, not to mention the fact that we may be near the end of it if we don't, if we don't get our act, act together. But one of, the, one of the things which is unique about this period is that for the first time in history, we have available to us all the great wisdom traditions of humankind. We're the first generation that has ever had access to all the major traditions. We're also the first generation that in the West which has ever had a psychology which is beginning to become sophisticated enough to understand these wisdom <coughs> traditions and to make sense of them in our own language and conceptual framework. And what's going on here at the California Institute of Integral Studies, what we've seen here tonight, is part of a very important process, a translation process whereby these wisdom traditions are being translated into languages and terms and conceptual networks with which we're familiar. Carl Jung introduced a very important concept when he was talking about uh, Wilhelm, the translator of the, the I Ching, and he called him a Gnostic intermediary. And he defined a Gnostic intermediary as someone who was capable of transmitting a wisdom from one culture to another but a transmission that required a very a particular type of process because it wasn't just a transmission of information, it was a transmission of wisdom. And 
a person who can do that has now come to be known as this Gnostic intermediary. A Gnostic intermediary has three real, three major tasks in transmitting and translating wisdom. The first is that they have to imbibe it and become it. There's a crucial difference between knowledge and wisdom, but we can think of it as knowledge is something that we have, and wisdom is something we must become. So the first task of the Gnostic intermediary is to incorporate, imbibe, become the wisdom which they would transmit. The second thing is to, they must know the conceptual framework of the people who they're communicating to. It's no, it would be no use if Jack had come here tonight and launched into his discussion of Buddhist meditation and the Abhidharma using purely the technical terms of Abhidharma. I spent some time studying Abhidharma. It's damn difficult. <laughs> it, and it's almost impenetrable. The most incredibly dry and dusty books I've ever run across in my life. Destined only for the Buddhist elite who really, <laughs> really committed to it. It's a real test. Um, so it's crucial that this be translated not only into something entertaining, but something which makes sense to us in our, in our language and, and conceptual framework. And the third, t so the, per the Gnostic intermediary has to know the language and conceptual framework of the person they're communicating to. They also have to be able to interface those two. Their own wisdom, they have to be able to speak directly from their own experience, translate that into the language so that they get an aha response from the other person. And I think that's what we've seen tonight, and it's a, my sense is that it's truly a crucial role. It's said that in the wisdom traditions that it's very easy for the old forms to go on, but the true, the true transmission of wisdom requires a translation of the, the formless radical truth into the forms appropriate to each culture and age. And in our time, it seems that perhaps the most, the easy language, the, the terminology or framework which most easily allows for that type of translation is psychology. We have a pretty sophisticated psychology here. As yet it doesn't really deal with the things that the wisdom traditions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sufism, Taoism, etc. deal with. But at least it has a conceptual framework where there's a potential for a marriage within the West that the particular areas have become interested in that humanistic and particularly transpersonal psychology. So we have the possibility for this translation now. We have a few people now who are doing that. And Jack, I think, is a nice example of what that whole process, someone who has imbibed the wisdom of another tradi tradition, studied intensively, practiced it for years, has studied psychology or philosophy or whatever an appropriate intellectual system in the West might be, and can then out of their own direct experience translate that. So we're seeing, I think, a new type of transmission going on here, <coughs> and a crucial one. And it may be that the Gnostic intermediaries of our time will be the people who will be psychologists in drag, who will be kind of putting this stuff out without it being too obvious just what is being put across, at least initially first, at least first. So we're looking at the possibility of a, of a true, the beginnings of a potential marriage between, between the Western psychology and the, the various wisdom traditions. Now, it can help a, lo look a little in looking at this potential marriage if we look at the various levels at which therapies have traditionally aimed to help people. The first level with which we're most familiar in the West and most of us as therapists have worked is simply reducing pathology and gross suffering. Pathology reduction, very important. And that's pretty much what Western psychology and psychiatry have been about. They were born out of, at least their clinical components, were born out of the need to treat psychiatrically, psychologically disturbed people the very sick. And a lot of our models have developed out of that. In fact, our models of health are pretty much based on what we think a person without, with psychiatric illness would look like if they didn't have psychiatric illness. And it's very interesting if you look at the, the studies of health. I just 
I, I, a few years ago when I got into this, I, I thought, well, okay, I'll do a research of the literature and I'll look up what health, you know, descriptions of health, and I went to the library and I didn't find anything. <laughs> I looked out, you know, look at the complete works of Sigmund Freud, the index, 400 references to neurosis. Now how many on health? Zero. Now somewhere I think there's some imbalance there. Now, so I, I decided that it would be very smart if, so, if I got people to educate me on what psychological health would be, so I edited a book on Beyond Health and Normality, Exceptional Studies of Exceptional Psychological Wellbeing, got all these people who'd studied this stuff to write chapters for me, and hopefully give me an education in the process. And the people we had to choose were pretty much people who were working outside the traditional Western psychological framework because our traditional Western model has been largely pathology-oriented. More recently, we've begun to move to what can be think of as the second major level, the existential level. And the existential level deals with the suffering and pain, which is an inherent component of living. That is, which sees suffering not as circumstantial, but as existential, an inherent part of our human existence, angst, for example, as one thing. So that now the person who suffers pain is not necessarily neurotic, but a person who is looking closely, who is mindful of their own life, using the terms of mindfulness, as Jack was talking about, is not someone, as Kierkegaard said, who is tranquilized by the trivial. A person who is opened to the reality of life and sees what Jack was describing about, that, th that life is, as, as one once said, nasty, brutal, and short, or, <laughs> alternatively, duke, duka, suffer, suffering, and each a change, and, uh, and not, right, yeah, <laughs> no, no self, which one of our friends translated those three things beautifully as uh, three things in life, of the three marks of existence, suffering, suffering, change, and selflessness as Life's tough. It'll put you through a lot of changes, but don't take it personally. <laughs> <clears throat> and the third major level is the level of transcendence, the route out of the pain and suffering which is existential in its nature, not circumstantial, not neurotic, but existential. And it's interesting that the existentialists, of course, felt that there was act actually no way out of existential pain and suffering, as of the psychoanalysts. You get to be a well-analyzed neurotic. You get to be a, you get to be a, if you're a healthy existentialist, you get to face the sorrow with courage, as Tillich recommended, or with authenticity, as Bugentel said, or with endurance, as James said. But there's no way out. It's a no-exit situation. The existentialists could it be said to have rediscovered the first noble truth of the Buddha, that life has suffering as an inherent component of it. But the wisdom trans traditions went further and said, yes, there is a way out. Yes, suffering is inescapable it's on its own level, but it and that which thinks it suffers can be transcended. The way out is by transcendence. This is the level, the so-called soteriological level, the level of liberation. It's a level which in the West, as Gordon Allport says, we have on the psychology of liberation nothing. And that's our imbalance. We have very, have very exquisite maps of pathology. We have some interesting stuff on, on existentialism coming out. We don't have much on, on the level of transcendence, on the soteriological level. Now, what's interesting is that the Eastern traditions are somewhat mirror images. They have exquisite, they, they are pragmatic psychologies aimed at liberation. They don't have terribly sophisticated models of early development or of the cartography of neuroses and uh, developmental fixations. So in some ways, these systems are complementary, which is very interesting indeed. And, and leads to the possibility of looking at the ways in which these things might mesh. Now, if you look at those levels of, psycho of, of psychological input or therapy, 
there's been an interesting, and we can kind of look at that in terms of the evolution of Western psychology, or clinical approaches. We started with uh, psychoanalysis, this is the so-called first force of Western psychology, Western psychiatry. And basically, it was very much a pathology-oriented system. And the healthiest you can be in that system is to come to terms with pathology and neurosis, to face them with courage. There's no possibility allowed for transcendence. So of necessity, stories of transcendence, of ego, transcendence, etc., of merging with the universe, of necessity get translated as pathology. There's no other way that system can translate it. And so we have, we have these wonderful accounts of the way that these, these descriptions were described. For example, mystical experiences have been interpreted as neurotic re regressions to union with the breast, ecstatic states viewed as narcissistic neurosis, and enlightenment dismissed as regression to intrauterine stages. And in the official, the, the textbook, the history of psychiatry, we have this description. This is the 1966 <coughs> history of psychiatry. The obvious similarities between schizophrenic regressions and the practices of yoga and Zen merely indicate that the general trend in oriental cultures is to withdraw into the self from an overbearingly difficult physical and social reality. So, perfectly logical from within that system. Then we had behaviorism, which reacted to the mentalism of psychoanalysis and said, no, you know, we've got to measure only you know, what can be observed, etc., etc. And also reacted somewhat negatively to these transcendents by ignoring it largely. Um, in, spite of the, in spite of the history of, we look back at William James, his uh, varieties of religious experience, he takes to task those people who commit what he calls medical materialism, who snuff out St. Teresa as an hysteric, who regard St. Paul as, as dis displaying evidence of discharging epileptic, epileptic focus, etc., etc. Um, but it really didn't do much good. And in response, it's interesting to look at Western psychology's evolution as an evolution kind of towards an increasing appreciation of more subtle forms of experience, of motivation, of pathology, of, of self-realization. In fact, it's kind of a, a, microcosmic, a microcosm of the principle observed in societies, which Arnold Toynbee, the famed historian, called the principle of increasing subtlety. He said that as cultures evolve and reach, move towards their peaks, they, the, what is most valued moves towards increasing, increasing subtlety. He also called the process of etherealization. We can see that in Western psychology, particularly with humanistic psychology emerging, taking its interest in, in, in health and well-being, and, and viewing uh, the most, what's most important as the study of health, the truly human experiences, and the identification from there of, of self-actualized people who have these wonderful peak experiences, very intense, euphoric, noetic, and as they all said, thank God, it only lasts a few minutes. <laughs> I couldn't handle it, I'd blow a fuse. <clears throat> and of course, transpersonal psychology arose out of an interest in these experiences and these very healthy people. When it was found that even the humanistic model couldn't encompass some of these experiences, people started turning towards the Eastern psychologies, Eastern religions, and to their amazement, found that these systems were comprehensible as applied psychologies for the induction of not only peak experiences, but whole ranges of peak experiences and maintaining them, not as, not as altered states, but as altered traits, enduring traits of, of person, of personality, of consciousness. And <clears throat> really amazing, I, I remember for myself when I when I f the shock I felt when I first realized after I'd been kind of gone through my therapy and kind of then moved on to doing a little meditation, things like that, and I found myself hanging out at places like Muktananda's ashram and things like that. I couldn't for the life of me understand why. 
And I was blown away when I suddenly was hit with the realization of what, of course, many people have discovered before me, that at their esoteric core, the great religions were actually roadmaps to higher states of consciousness. And to recognize that just rather than to see them as the opiate of the masses, as I'd always assumed they were, was truly extraordinary for me. I mean, it was one of those blinding insights into the totally obvious. Uh, and so suddenly we could see these Eastern traditions as roadmaps to higher states. And then, but of course, that means very little to most of us brought up in a Christian background. I mean, there's not too much of roadmaps to higher states of consciousness in much of what we know of Christianity. And it's very interesting that at this particular time in history, when the first time in history we have a system which is capable of making sense of religions as, high, as roadmaps to higher states. This talk is continued on side two of this cassette at this point. It's very interesting that at this particular time in history, when for the first time we have a system which is capable of making sense of religions as roadmaps to higher states, that by some cosmic coincidence or humor, we also have the rediscovery of the Nagamadi Library. The Nagamadi Library is a collection of early Christian texts dating back as far as the second century AD. They give us a very different picture of early Christianity suggesting that it was a much more diverse tradition than we have previously recognized, and that different schools existed, ranging all the way from what we've come to think of as traditional Christianity through to much more mystical groups known as the Gnostics. So we now have some of the writings of the Gnostics, which we have descriptions of Christ claiming not talking about sin and guilt, but a sin and redemption, but of illusion and enlightenment, not speaking himself as unique, the only son of God, but as a person who has awakened, whom others can become identical with, even one with, etc. And as Elaine Pagels, who's a very sober religious scholar, said, you know, the wor in a different context, the words of the living Jesus could be mistaken for the words of the living Buddha. So kind of come full circle with a psychology evolving towards the recognition of the significance from a psychological perspective at least of the great religions at the same time as we have begun to find those same roots in our own. With that knowledge we can make sense of so much stuff and so many of the things Jack has talked about. Um, meditation we can now see as a training in concentration just as he was talking about, cultivating those particular mental factors. We can see ethicality which we have thought of as morality, you know, you must do this, as a systematic pairing away of attachment. One of the, and uh, he was speaking of greed as one of the unhealthy factors. We can see see ethicality as a as a pairing away of or or diminution or deconditioning uh, or counter conditioning of the mental factors of greed, of anger, aversion. We can make sense of these. We can also make sense, of course, of giving up the world. The idea that one lets go greed to these things for 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 things which are of increasing subtlety, yet are higher on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's a, it's a hierarchy which goes from more gross to more subtle. It goes from external stimuli and rewards and reinforcers to internal stimuli and rewards and reinforcers. So we can make sense of that, make sense of voluntary simplicity, which uh, you know, or a renunciation as a very pragmatic tool. So all these things begin to make sense within our own framework. We can look at the Abhidharma, which Jack talked about, this exquisite system, one of the most, truly the first systematic psychology in human history, also the most, by far the most sophisticated phenomenological psychology, this map of every conceivable state of consciousness. And now we can, we can see this as such a, a rich system making sense making very fine sense, and doing something which we weren't able to do in the West. You know, Western psychology, Western psychology is sometimes said to have begun with the foundation of Wundt's, li Wundt's uh, research laboratory in, I think, 1887, when they specifically set out to map the elements of experience. And Titchener in America carried that on, you know, sat their subjects down, trained them, and they looked inside and, and tried to find stuff. And the only problem was they couldn't get any reliable results. <laughs> 
No one could agree on what the elements of experience were. No one could get, get a convergent validation between laboratories. We, and we can begin to make sense out of this now because they trained their subjects for tens or dozens of hours. The Abhidharma is, was written by people who, and is under, best understood by people who devoted thousands of hours to very, very intense practice, exploring, meta, exploring the mind at a very, very refined level. So the Abhidharma is a phenomenological psychology that works and has worked and stood the test of time for 25, almost about 2,200 years now. And we failed in the West because we didn't appreciate just how difficult, how really demanding a task that is. And we can look at uh, a quote by Jacob Needleman. He said, in our modern world, it's always been assumed that in order to observe oneself, all that is required is for a person to look within. No one ever imagines that self-observation may be a highly disciplined skill, which requires longer training than any other skill we know. The bad reputation of introspection in the West results from the particular notion that all by himself, without guidance and training, a man or woman can come to accurate observation of their own thought and perception. In contrast to this, one could very well say that the heart of the psychological disciplines in the East and in the ancient Western world consists of training at self-study. So in terms of another Western, recent Western concept in terms of top state-specific sciences, we can look at the Abhidharma, which Jack was describing as a state-specific technology or a science or a psychology which was created by people in a meditative state of consciousness, a highly trained introspective state which is best comprehended and tested by people in a similar state. And it's important to remember that all the great sages have said, you know, we, we tend in the West to want to do experiments to test the validity of such systems, but the great sages have all pointed out that the true test, testing ground of these systems lies within us and is us. So, so we have this wonderful system here and this recent discovery in the West of this convergence. You had last year there was this wonderful article in Psychology Today by Ellen Langer reviewing her studies of mindlessness in which she had this incredible discovery She was with that people just weren't conscious of what they were doing. They're on automatic all the time. And she described it as this extraordinary important and novel discovery. <laughs> and I think I reached the, pe the peak of my academic career because I got a letter accepted by Psychology Today. And I was able to point out that the Buddha had described this 2,500 years ago. But the, a crucial, there's a crucial discovery here. Again, we have this convergence of, of conceptual frameworks. And the point that Jack made of mindfulness being so crucial as a, ther as a therapeutic tool harks back to, to some of the things that have come up more recently in Western psychology also. Fritz Perls, awareness in and of itself is curative. Also, we can do a wonderful up-leveling of Western psychology. If we look at the, the movement from, from psychoanalysis to behaviorism, the behaviorisms kind of out-contextualize the psychoanalysts and said, well, psychoanalysis sometimes works because the therapist inadvertently reinforces the patient correctly. <laughs> and pretty much just kind of outflank the psychoanalyst. Now we have an opportunity of outflanking the behaviorist by pointing out that perhaps the crucial element in all therapies is exactly what Jack was saying, bringing more awareness to, to, to experience. That mindfulness in and of itself is curative. That if you look at what psychoanalysis, what beha even behaviorism does, all behavioral techniques can be looked at as ways of forcing people to experience what they weren't willing to experience before. You know, you set up a, a desensitization program, get them to imagine earthquakes or whatever they're scared of. You send them out and flood them, you put them in the thing they're scared of. You get them to experience what they'd be unwilling to experience. It fundamentally seems to boil down to that. So we have this wonderful kind of convergence coming on be between these different systems. Very intriguing, very very remarkable, kind of very exciting time in time in history, and uh, just want to. Th and I want to just thank you for.
doing this for? <laughs> affects the capacity or the <coughs> mindfulness of the person that they're with. It's pretty simple to refer to one's experience. Um, if you are with someone and they don't notice something very obvious happening, we'll take the obvious first, a, a dog walks in the room or something like that, and you say, hey, look, um, you're aware of it, you can share that awareness or that attention and, and capture their attention and bring it to, to what's happening. Similarly, in therapy, I see it a lot as a, as a social meditation where two people sit down and a lot of what I discover that I do is pay attention along with that person. And then sometimes I see um, they're talking about something and they look terribly sad and tears are rolling down their cheeks and they don't even know they're sad. They're so wrapped up in what they're talking about. And I say, oh, have you noticed there are, there are tears or you look very sad? And they say, oh, yeah, it really makes me sad. And I wasn't quite aware of it. This is on a sort of intermediate level. I think there's an even more subtle level in which it happens. And I don't know. I don't want to get um, too mystical about it. But it feels like when one is in the presence of another person who isn't on automatic pilot, who's awake, who's present, that that very quality of being present somehow affects us and jolts us into being more present ourselves. Yeah, yeah I, think that, I think there is an entraining process. And I, I'm actually here because of it. Because I, uh, when I came to this country in 72, I was... Uh, very hardcore neuroscientist, and I looked up the research on, on psychotherapy and decided it didn't work. Well, so I had the interesting situation of doing psychotherapy in my residency training without believing it worked. Fortunately, I had uh, a, a, some insurance, so I got to get some free therapy, and I went to see Jim Bugenthal, and boy, did I, <laughs> was I wrong. He was a very sensitive man who trained me by virtue of his own sensitivity to my experience to, to also do that. Basically, he had a greater level of sensitivity and mindfulness to his own experience and was able, by, by being mindful of his experience and what I evoked in him, to feed back to me at a level far below what I was capable of getting. And he literally trained me in experiential sensitivity to an extent which I hadn't even known was possible. For example, within a couple of months, I was experiencing synesthesia, the, that is, you know, I would I would hear something and I'd see visual images and feel sensations in my body. I realized that I'd always been there, but I just hadn't been aware of it. Which suddenly flips the whole data on synesthesia around, which because we've thought of that as this rare phenomenon, and now we know we can simply train people in it if you have someone sensitive enough to give that kind of feedback. Um, so yeah, I think that, and I I'm, I'm, don't know how far that goes. I'm sure it must go deeper and deeper still. And. I'm prepared to believe, you know, what, what has been recommended by so many sages. You know, if you want to awaken, hang around those who are awake. Please. Would I speak on the distinctions between maya and samsara and how they relate to psychotherapy? Um, I'll try. <laughs> Uh, maya is a Sanskrit word that refers to illusion, um, and uh, it, in a general context or meaning, it says that everything that we experience is illusion, that there is a reality, but that that which we experience isn't, isn't that reality. 
Samsara is another both Sanskrit and Pali word that that refers to the rounds of of or cycles of birth and death and all the realms within which it happens and they are um, they're not synonymous because in some traditions in some Buddhist traditions uh, samsara is considered as illusory um, and in others it's not it's considered as experienceable in here but rather simply impermanent and I think for me what's what's useful rather than imposing a philosophy of saying well it is it is illusion or it's not illusion if you go to a Zen master and you say it's all illusion do you know what he generally does as the stories go he takes his stick and he hits you. He says, it's illusion, huh? How does that feel? And you say, no, no, stop. <laughs> so rather than referring to some philosophy about it being illusion, um, I think what's available to us in our experience is, as I spoke of, to see that in every moment, words disappear, sounds disappear, sights disappear, that it is in constant process of arising and passing away. And we see it only at the grossest level because of the limited training of our mind that Roger was pointing out. If you train yourself in concentration and in subtler levels of awareness or mindfulness, you can get to where what seems so solid dissolves. You look at a sight and you see it as flashing pictures or as, as just instantaneous moments of arising and passing of visual sensation or instantaneous moments of arising and passing of sound along with moments of consciousness and it's possible in training to more subtle or altered states which are simply high degrees of awareness and concentration that that which seems solid about our world can very directly and not not some special mystical way, but simply through the repeated training, be seen as simply a rapid succession of sights and sounds and taste and smells and thoughts and, and perceptions about it that arise and vanish. And then you can give it various names like maya because it seems solid and it's not, or like samsara because it's this process that keeps itself moving and going under certain laws. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> Please. Could you comment on uh, uh, attachment and, and love, particularly uh, in um, male female relationships? I see attachment is something you avoid, and yet it seems like there's an aspect of the other word, uh, almost like attachment. When I comment on attachment and love, it, it gives me it gives me an opportunity to say a few things that I left out <laughs> before, and it's really a central question. Um, one of the phrases that Ramdas has used a lot in his teaching and sort of his discovery uh, of uh, of his own mind as he's done his spiritual practice and came back and found out that it hadn't done all the things that he hoped it would, and that he was still neurotic in many ways. Um, sometimes many, many, is that he <laughs> he likes that. He's a public confessor, so it's all right. Um, is that he said he'd become a connoisseur of his neurosis. <laughs> you know, this Now, there's an exquisite example of it. And so one of the first points that I want to make is if we set up a model, just as if we have a model of Maya and it's all illusion and la-di-da, it doesn't matter, and then you, if you drive on the left side of the street, you discover what that, how far that model gets you. Um, similarly, if you set up a model that one should not be attached, um, there's a tremendous amount of suffering trying to live that way because you are attached. Rather, what's useful is first to remember the principles of the Four Noble Truths, which don't at all tell you how to be, but simply say the way that the world is constructed is there is suffering, that it is a function of attachment that if there's more attachment you suffer more and if there's less attachment you suffer less and my teacher used to wander around the monastery sometimes and kind of poke at people and say um, are you suffering much today you know he liked to make fun of people and sometimes they'd say yes and he'd say oh gee you must be very attached today and then he'd walk on and talk to somebody else and it's not like one is good or bad it's simply that that's part of the laws of how it works similarly you need to discover that 
with all these things, with judgment, with attachment, with desire, with fear, that the way to work with them is not to say, oh, I want to get rid of it and try and chop it away, because what you do then is you bring more judgment or aversion to it. It's simply to examine it, to use mindfulness or awareness to study it. It can be in relation to simple things like that food story I told of that teacher, or it can be in the hardest things of all, which are in interpersonal relations, or relations between a mother and a child, or a father and a child. Even so, the principles are the same. If you have a child, and you want it to be a certain way, and you're attached, the amount of attachment you have will mean that much suffering. It's, it's directly observable to you. And so it's not to say that you shouldn't, or that you should get rid of your desires, but begin by observing them and seeing how they work. And a lot of times all that it takes is you see that, well, this is very hot, it's painful. And through, through sometimes repeated 10, 20, 100 times observation, gradually, we're kind of slow, most of us are slow learners, I am, you get the point that that is actually painful. Now the wonderful thing about love is that it doesn't require attachment. It's possible to love someone, to be there for them, to be committed in a relationship to going through the various uh, experiences in time that a relationship brings, pleasant and painful and close and, and apart and tearful and joyful, without a lot of attachment. It's not to set it up as a model, but it's rather a possibility to see. And so then what the, what the work becomes is to see where you are, to see the places you're most attached, which cause you suffering or cause you get angry or upset with the other person, and also see in your observation that in those things it's possible to be, to let go a little more if you choose to, or to be loving and allowing of something different than that. If you listen to the top 40 or turn on the soaps in the afternoon, you'll hear a familiar description that I can't live without you. If you're not available, I might, I just obsess about you. When you're not here, I get goosebumps and I think of you and my heart palpates and I get tachycardia and I sweat and so forth. Those are the symptoms of heroin withdrawal. <laughs> Now, we have a, some very bizarre beliefs in this culture about the nature of, the nature of love. And, it's very, and beliefs are just extraordinarily powerful in the, as self-fulfilling prophecies, as creating what we expect. My favorite quote about beliefs comes from my favorite psychologist, Henry Ford. And <laughs> Henry Ford said, those who believe they can do something and those who believe they can't are both right. <laughs> we have some very weird beliefs about love. If you are not very upset if I don't come over, then you obviously don't love me. If you don't, etc., etc. In other words, this it is, as Jack was saying, this massive confusion between the two. And I guess the only the the thing I want to kind of throw in here, the practical thing is that it seems very important to, as Jack said, n to not judge, not condemn, to accept the, the, you know, we have these things, but to also be aware of the way our culture reinforces and confuses this confusion. And really, it is not okay in our culture a lot to have, to love in a non-attached way, or it's likely to be much misunderstood. So we have to be very aware of the cultural forces pushing us towards attachment before we can start to disentangle ourselves. One more brief thing to say about it. Love is a very uh, limited word in the English language or in that it refers to such a wide range of experience that it's hard to tell what it means. And in some other languages, in some of the Oriental languages, or even, I think, in Russian or Czechoslovakian, there are three or five or seven words. There's the love of, I love ice cream, you know, and there's the love of uh, kind of businessman's love. Well, I'll love you 
so much, if you'll love me back so much. And there's the love of a mother for a child or a father for a child. Um, and there's the love which doesn't demand anything at all. And there are many levels of meaning of that word. And uh, it gets confused because of the language as well. Please. Uh, when you spoke of ways of working with uh, difficulty or suffering, you talked about um, uh, letting go, letting be, sublimation, etc. Um, do you see these um, as all subsets or related to um, consciousness and attention? Or uh, how do you see attention, the concept of attention interfacing with these ways of working? I see all six of those that I presented as uh, as for them to operate properly, for one to, to use them to deal with a difficulty, they must come together with attention. The first one of letting go requires attention. You have to see what you're going to let go of. Letting be requires attention to allow it to be there. And all the rest of them require attention. If the attention is missing, as I pointed out, then what happens, especially in the lower ones, uh, on the list of... Uh, acting it out in fantasy or acting it out in reality, is there simply an automatic repetition of the habit or the particular pattern with no change at all. And attention is actually the key for the change in all of those. I was thinking more of shifts of focus of attention or shifts of focus. Shifts of focus. Yeah. That is movement of attention from um, one level of experience to another level. Hmm. It's a good question, and I'm, I'm not sure, actually, the answer. I imagine in a lot of those cases, as I try to think about it, that part of paying attention does shift focus, perhaps from the story to the feelings, or from, from the exterior or blaming to one's own body sensation. Um, but I'm not sure that's always necessary, and I think more, uh, more often it's simply that people are on automatic pilot, or they're not very attentive. Um, and it's a bringing attention to some aspect of the present situation, even more than shifting levels. But I'm not sure, actually. I was thinking especially in relation to uh, um, suppression, concept of suppression. Mm -hmm. if, uh, we can look at process suppression instead of uh, fighting not to experience something, as the psychoanalytic def definitions would uh, suggest, uh, as opposed to the process of suppression involving voluntarily placing one's attention um, somewhere else, uh, mm -hmm. and wondering if then you end up with the same thing as you do with letting go or letting be. Um, again, uh, it's I'm not sure how to answer you. It's good. I've seen in my experience that I can shift my attention from something to something else, which is a kind of suppression, or in some cases a letting go. But either one can happen, um, and it's not the shift of attention alone that determines it. Um, sometimes I'll shift away and I'll come back and it'll still be there, it'll be waiting for me. Um, and in part of it, it, I think it's determined by whether there's, there's been a willingness at some point to experience it fully or not. If I haven't experienced it fully, then it keeps repeating, whether it's in therapy or meditation. I don't know. <laughs> Ralph, please. Um, you, you presented the uh, Abhidharma Buddhist uh, psychology, uh, both of you have, as a, as a living tradition, and I would you know, te certainly tend to agree with you that it's a, it's a, it's a living and it's a timeless teaching that uh, was, was brought forth uh, uh, as an eternal type of thing, speaking really eternal truth. What I'm wondering is whether you've thought about and whether you care to comment on um, anything that you have thought that is like could be said specifically to someone trying to deal with our world as it is now it seems like many people feel that where we are now in the world now is different than it's ever been before because because of the fact that we're we're in a in a situation where we might end ourselves where we might commit species suicide and uh, global wide destruction, self-destruction of the planet as a whole. And I'm wondering you know, what that living, eternal, really timeless Buddhist tradition would say to somebody who is trying to deal with that situation. 
I'm not sure about Abhidhamma specifically, but I think that many of the Buddhist teachers I've heard speak in, in response to that have talked along the lines of the, the fact that the threats to human survival and well-being we're now facing are all, for the first time in history, human-caused. And that they can all, as such, are they all, all fundamentally, therefore, psychological in nature, and can therefore all be traced to their psychological roots. And you can take various models in the Abhidharma model. You can look at all these, the problems we're now confronting on the globe as coming back to the through, three root causes of, of suffering that Jack was talking about, greed, hatred, and, and delusion. And I defy anyone to name a major global threat to us now that is not a function of greed, hatred, and delusion. And, aver and aversion includes fear. You can look at, for example, the current international situation as simply a reflection of fear, a self-perpetuating mechanism. We build more weapons, which create more fear, etc., which, and so forth. Likewise, I've heard them speak of the fact that these threats to our survival can be used to make us aware of the existential realities of our life, particularly the knowledge of death. And the Buddhists are very aware uh, and very, really focus on the idea of the unknowability and uncertainty of our time of death. And that just as Carlos Castaneda speaks of keeping death over one's shoulder as an advisor, so the Buddhists also emphasize being aware of the uncertainty of in a way which we've been able, most of us, to put off in the past. So they serve a very useful function there. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.